thank the direct the uh, uh, organizing committee for inviting me here. This is a wonderful opportunity actually to visit again with some great friends here, and um, I'm most happy to be a part of this celebration. Thanks to uh, Luis Rodriguez and uh, to uh, uh, Susanna. Susanna. Uh, Susanna. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the infrared galaxy and basically what we've learned. And I'm not going to uh, basically talk simply about the Glam survey. Um, I'll also uh, pull in some radio data uh, and other infrared surveys. Um, so um, I could have chosen a whole slew of different topics to talk about here. Uh, just last month, we uh, celebrated, uh, well, there's about 520 papers so far that's been uh, uh, published based on GLIMPS data. And that number, of course, is growing with time. So it's being used a lot. So I've chosen four uh, uh, subtopics. I want to talk a little bit about large-scale galactic structure and what we can learn from the uh, infrared and radio from that. And I'll talk a little bit about infrared bubbles turns out that the galactic plane, a hallmark of galactic plane, uh, is that it's just riddled with bubbles. Uh, we had a talk from Bob just uh, before this of rings, but these guys, as I say, well, I, I'm going to argue are more or less three-dimensional bubbles. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about star formation and what we call egos. And then I want to interrupt, end up, end, end up uh, talking about the, uh, the pH distribution in the disk of the galaxy. So let me start uh, on the large scale galactic structure. Why infrared? Well, one, it's low to zero extinction of mid and far infrared uh, wavelengths, which gives us access, access to objects throughout the disk of the galaxy. Uh, turns out that we have a incredible uh, standard candle in these red clump giants that are very bright and uh, uh, very numerous. And they're basically uh, Mid-infrared, as I say, we're more or less independent of pretty much free of extinction. Uh, and uh, we're observing in four different wave bands, and so as a consequence, we can uh, correct for extinction, in fact. So we can get uh, actually good distances to these guys, and say there are lots of them. So I'm going to uh, start out with a, uh, a schematic that uh, Robert Hurd and uh, Bob Benjamin put together in 2008, which has been used now all over the world that I've noticed in the last uh, few years. Uh, and they put together, at that time, the, uh, all of the data that they thought was uh, uh, good, reliable data to try to see if they could make a, a, a face on uh, image of what our galaxy would look like. And basically, they have two main spiral arms coming off the end of the bar here, down this way. And then there are some uh, uh, intermediate arms or minor arms in the galaxy, including the three teleparsec arms coming along here. Uh, and so I'm going to use this now to uh, basically kind of review where we think we are uh, right now on our understanding of galactic structure. I'm going to start back with one of the earliest determinations of uh, galactic structure, or the structure of the universe at that time. <coughs> and uh, basically, uh, William and Car Caroline Herschel and Simpson uh, 65, uh, found that the universe was a flat kind of distribution uh, uh, with, in fact, the sigma drift here, you can see. And this is about the amount of the galactic plane that they actually uh, uh, measured. That's about the, how far uh, optical photons, uh, how far you can detect optical photons in the disk of the galaxy. Now, the 1920s cap time uh, found that the universe, or uh, the, at least the uh, distribution of stars, uh, was a flat big distribution, just like uh, Herschel found, uh, and with decreasing star counts uh, as stars become fainter, uh, rather similar to Herschel's picture. Uh, there have been a number of uh, attempts, of other attempts, but the major step was taken in the 1950s with the uh, uh, H1 observations, uh, where four features were found that had correlated velocity structures that were interpreted as four spiral arms. Uh, also, globular clusters have been 
uh, measure of their distribution is bound to be concentrated in the galactic center is referred to as the nuclear pulse. So this is kind of a, when we started our survey, this light area here is the survey at a glimpse. So a glimpse, by the way, means galactic infrared midplane survey extraordinaire. And uh, the extraordinary, I think you will agree later when you see some of the images, that it is extraordinary. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is the first set of observations. We took these two slices in, in the sun, uh, and this rendition is up here. And so uh, this is quadrant one, this is fourth quadrant of the galactic plane here. And here, here are the four uh, radio uh, uh, spiral arms. And so, and, and here's the nuclear ball. So this is what uh, we started out with. Now, one of the simplest things you can do with this data, by the way, we've, we've, we've uh, uh, basically, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, we, we've produced a catalog of about 200 million point sources. So it's a lot of data. You can do a lot of interesting statistics when you have uh, a couple hundred million uh, objects. So one of the first things we did was simply plot the stellar density as a function of longitude. And so this is the first, uh, first quadrant here from 2 degrees to 28 degrees, 28 to uh, 46 degrees, and so forth. So the top, they're in pairs here, the top uh, bar is always uh, the first quadrant. The second quadrant is the same slice of the galactic plane on the other side of the galactic center. So these, these two slots, slots here, or slices, are uh, equidistant from the galactic center. And uh, there's something interesting about this. What is it? It's a stellar density here, increasing in the red. Look at this slice, compare it with that slice. Uh, it turns out that there's about 25% more stars inside about 30, 30 degrees longitude in the uh, quadrant one than in the fourth quadrant. And that was, uh, when we first saw this, we were puzzled, what the heck's going on here? We've also uh, placed here some, some of the major molecular clouds in, the, in these various directions. Was it actually known before? It's a not, No, not this. No, it was not, no. This is, this is absolutely new. Um, okay, here's, uh, just look at the upper plot here. This is just the number density of stars as a function of longitude again. And uh, there's some wiggles and bumps here, and those are all real. I mean, we're, we're talking about large numbers of stars here. Uh, and here are the, uh, uh, spectral, the uh, spiral arms known at that point. And uh, I want to draw your attention particularly to this, uh, what was called the Centaurus arm at that time. And you see that there's a, a nice bump that uh, comes up here. In fact, we think that's the tangency to the Centaurus arm that, that shows up very clearly. Now, and that's about 50 degrees in galactic center. The Sagittarius arm shows absolutely, which is essentially the same distance from galactic centers in uh, the first quadrant, uh, shows no evidence for that arm at all. And the wiggles here and the scutum arm, it's not clear exactly what's going on, but you can see the nuclear bulge coming up here very, very fast as well. Um, okay, so uh, if we're just looking, I mean, the dist what we're showing the distribution here of is uh, basically mostly red clump giants, or red giants. Okay, so they're luminous, they're very uh, numerous uh, in, the, in the disk of the galaxy, and they simply dominate. Uh, the uh, objects in the mid infrared. And we don't see any evidence for that arm uh, in the old stellar population. Okay, so you can do this another way. You can plot the number density of stars as a function of magnitude and brightness going from brightest objects upward until you uh, reach the uh, saturation limit or the uh, confusion limit, one or the other here. And um, what we plotted here are two different lines of sight, uh, 55 degrees from the galactic center. Uh, this, the red is the uh, north of the uh, uh, first quadrant, blue is the uh, fourth quadrant. And you see that the slope and the number is basically the same in both directions in the galaxy. If you move in a little further, uh, 35 degrees from the galactic uh, center, uh, again, you get the same number of stars, the same slope. But as you go inside this 30 degrees, 
you get this dichotomy between the uh, first quadrant and the second quadrant. Uh, and that's a very clear uh, result. Uh, and there's also this little interesting thing up here to put a question mark about, which uh, caused us to scratch our heads quite a bit to figure out what the heck's going on there. Uh, now, one thing you can do is that all of these have about the same slope. So there's another way to plot uh, this data. You determine what the average slope is on this uh, uh, stellar density versus magnitude plot. You can plot it a different way. You can use colors uh, to uh, plot the slope of the, of the number of stars, number density of stars, uh, as a function of magnitude or brightness uh, against longitude. And uh, it turns out this is a very powerful tool, actually. Uh, so in this duration here, you're going to fainter objects. There's more stars in this region, so you don't see many bumps and wiggles in there. And there are fewer stars here, and there's a little bit more noise. So we understand that. Uh, this line up at the top here basically defines the <coughs> uh, And of course, the right around the galactic right center region, you get this dip because the uh, density of stars gets so high that it's just going to be uh, from the confusion limit. But this feature here stands up like a sore thumb. And basically, what we're seeing here is that hump that I showed you in the other plot. The red is the sharp. Uh, uh, increase in, in slope, then it comes back to the average slope here, and then levels off and uh, 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 moves up here. And you notice that the the uh, as you go to toward the galactic center, uh, the stars become fainter and fainter. That describes that, uh, and so that tells us something. It turns out you can model that, and it's a uh, a very interesting model. Uh, Basically, this feature is determined by a long, what's called a long bar, a central bar that goes right through the center of our galaxy. And it's, a, it's a huge bar. I mean, it, it uh, comes out to 30 degrees. It's a major feature of our galaxy. And uh, its orientation, you, you can just uh, model the place where you come back to the uh, average slope, is about 45 degrees or so to the uh, direction between the sun and the uh, center of the galaxy. These little uh, regions here are basically do the foreground electric planets. Okay, so now that brings us back to thinking a little bit about uh, the original uh, radio uh, uh, models for spiral arms. We took the bar in there, and then we got the bright idea uh, that maybe these, these arms may in fact be related to that, uh, to the bar here. And so, for example, what uh, we originally, originally referred to as the uh, scoot of crux arm uh, might, in fact, uh, come off the end of that bar. And the um, uh, Perseus arm could very well uh, be to trace that. Now, at this point, we also start thinking a little bit about what the heck we're measuring. And uh, what we're measuring are these red clump giants that are beautiful standard candles. So it gives us a way to actually determine, uh, not by going through a model, uh, a, a, a dynamical model of the galaxy, which has always been the problem when you want to get a face on picture of what our galaxy looks like. You have to assume some kind of dynamic model. Dynamic model. You have a standard, a standard candle that is basically independent of extinction. You can measure the distance of these stars, and so you can start to trace uh, major features in the galaxy. Uh, let me just, uh, I'm going to show a little thing here that uh, shows the, for example, the pitch angle. This is a pitch angle about 13 degrees, and you can see it's very sensitive. Uh, a one degree change uh, doesn't uh, fit the, the uh, picture very well, but we're not sure that we know what that picture looks like. So I'm coming back now to this picture that uh, 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 Bob uh, Hurt and uh, uh, Bob Benjamin uh, produced in 2008, uh, without the benefit of a lot of this other stuff that we now think we know. Now, I've changed the picture because the sun's down here now. And um, so I'm going to just plot what we think we know now about this large-scale galactic structure. Here's a little example. I, yeah, 
show a little example here. Uh, Tom Davis and uh, uh, Pat Thaddeus' work on the outer scutum, uh, scutum centaurus arm. And this is a picture of it in uh, galactic quarters. This is a picture of it in LV plot. And you see it's a, uh, this is completely uh, depends only on observed quantities. So there's no modeling or anything involved here. And uh, so these yellow dots are places where you see, o, you see CO emissions, so you, you know that there's molecular gas in there. Uh, and uh, you see that there's a, a uh, well-defined uh, um, correlated uh, velocity structure there. OK, so I'm going to just go quickly now through what we think we, what we, think we know. And the amazing thing to me is that this schematic that was done fits the observations incredibly well. So uh, here's the sun, and, the, and it's on the, what's called the Orion. Um, um, uh, well, it's not what you really call an arm, it's an uh, Orion um, um, spur. spur. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> the Orion spur. Thanks. I, as you get older, you, you start to find there are words that you know, but you simply can't pull them out of the air. And I'll do this several times during my talk, I'm sure. Sure. OK, so. Uh, Let's just start. Look, this is this 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 part here, this part here, some of this, uh, and so forth was known. Uh, the three telepars I can't to see has just recently been uh, finally detected. So here's the uh, nuclear pulse. Uh, this extension, which we think is an extension of the outer arm, uh, was uh, basically uh, found by uh, McClure Griffiths uh, in H1. We're not quite sure. They haven't detected CO or star formation uh, in this part of the arm yet, but that may come later. Um, so that's 2004. The long bar that we just talked about was basically uh, Bob Benjamin and the Glimpse team, uh, which detected the long bar in the first quadrant. And that was done in 2005. Uh, the inner bar, this guy here, uh, it's been detected, uh, actually two papers at least out of that, uh, uh, Nishiyama et al. and uh, Gonzalez et al. in uh, 2005-2012. And that was uh, detected in the red, with red clump giants. Uh, the three caliparsec arm uh, was finally detected. Uh, Jan Ort uh, said in, 19, in the 1950s that that uh, three caliparsec arm, the far caliparsec arm, ought to be visible. It only took about 50 something years, 60 years to, to actually detect it. But uh, Tom Damon and Platt uh, uh, Thaddeus have actually now detected that in H1CO and in star formation by Ann Green in 2009. So that's, that's now a reasonably well established feature. The uh, X shaped bar in the galactic center uh, was detected in uh, 2010 by McWilliam and, and uh, Zocali. Uh, and not off at all, uh, but red, using red clump giants. Uh, this is the segment of the outer Skosin arm. And the amazing thing is that it actually, the distance is right for this outer arm. Uh, we had no idea that, that you know, what the, what the scale of, of this thing was when this schematic was made. But in fact, it, it uh, fits uh, almost precisely. So that was detected in 2011 uh, by Tom uh, Damon and Pat Thaddeus. Uh, the other end of the bar was, has now been detected by uh, Zokowski, uh, Bob Benjamin, et, et al. Uh, using red clump giants uh, and uh, some of the deeper uh, infrared data that uh, Glimpse doesn't. Uh, it's hard to pull out for Glimpse. Uh, there's an extension now on the uh, inner Perseus arm uh, by Benjamin and uh, Dame and uh, Bania, uh, basically in a, a CO and star formation. It's not clear whether we've uh, been able to uh, trace that in H1 yet. Um, okay. Now then there's the, uh, what's referred to as the warped uh, truncated red clump disk of the galaxy that looks like comes something like this, although there's, that's a little a bit more fuzzy. Uh, there are a couple of uh, papers on, on that, 2011-2014. Uh, this parts of these arms here, it's not clear when we'll ever be able to, to I mean, the, um, things really get problematic here as you're looking from the sun in through all of this, this stuff. So 
So I don't know whether we'll be able to get that or not. So there are question marks here. We need to see if we can connect this part of, of uh, this arm. Um, okay, well, I'm not going to say more about that. So I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit about infrared bubbles. Uh, and uh, here, the, the new contributions are basically a better understanding of the impact of dust uh, clumping ionization structure, which I'm not going to say much about here today. Uh, we do have spectra of this that uh, are actually very informative, but we've not gotten, there, gotten it written up yet, uh, and photo uh, dissociation reasons. So let's move out. I'll just remind you, uh, the four uh, IRAC bands, uh, band one here, or channel one, as we've written it here, has a PAH feature in it. Uh, this is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, at, at about 3.2 uh, microns. Uh, and the uh, band uh, channel three and channel four are basically completely dominated by PAH features. When they're, when they're excited, that's what's going to dom dominate the emission. Uh, there are also uh, various ions that you can see here. And in fact, uh, well, there's bracket alpha line and then Iron 2, argon 2, argon 3, and so forth. Uh, now, uh, channel 1 and 2 both have um, molecular hydrogen features. These, right, these sharp features here are molecular hydrogen uh, and CO. These are shocked uh, uh, transitions. You need pretty high uh, densities and temperatures to get those. Uh, channel 3 is, is dominated by this guy. These lines uh, may or may not contribute very much. So just as a reminder, so you can understand what's going on. Um, boy, I'm, that's interesting. I've never seen that. Uh, well, it's perfectly clear in my, on my uh, uh, machine. There's blue blotches. I don't know where it's coming from, but it comes somewhere between here and there. Uh, these are stars, <laughs> and they're very, they're very sharp <laughs> in the original. But what I want to show is, is these bubbles. Okay? And there's a, a, a general um, feature here that you, you, the 24 micron emission, which is thermal dust emission, uh, is basically uh, occupies the center regions of, of practically all of these bubbles. The 8 micron, which is a green uh, emission here, uh, is a basically sharp uh, uh, shell around the 24 micron uh, emission. And then the 4.5 is what uh, produces star, or uh, it's really uh, the tracer of stars here. And uh, uh, say, I don't know where these blotches come from. Uh, here's another image. Uh, good, the stars are a little clearer here. Uh, this showing that, you know, you see, you see these bubbles throughout the disk of the galaxy, and they all have the same morphology when you uh, plot them in, in these sets of these wavelength bands. The other thing, though, is that you see all of this green, that green is 8 micron emission, it's pHs, and the pH is just, uh, they basically just are throughout the entire disk of the galaxy. And I'm going to come back to that because it's kind of, it got some interesting issues with regard to it. So I'm going to center it on one bubble, it's called N49, and uh, you see that there's a shell of, of 24 micron, bright 24 micron emission, which is thermal dust. Inside that, I don't, it's very doesn't seem very clear here, but there's a an O5 star right here, and there's a uh, uh, hole in the central part, or basically a hole. It's a dip in dip in the emission, and then surrounding that is our uh, uh, PAH uh, shell. It's actually a PDR region around that. So here's a way to kind of illustrate what's uh, what what the uh, distribution of different wavelengths is in this. You just take a cut across this uh, nebula. The 8 micron emission shows that shell there. Now you notice in the center, it doesn't go all the way to zero. Uh, and then the uh, solid line here is radio continuum. It's 1.4 uh, gigahertz continuum emission uh, expanded or uh, multiplied up by about a, a several hundred. Uh, the 8 micron is also, uh, I think, expanded up by a factor of eight. And then the dashed line here, or curve, is the uh, uh, 24 micron emission. You see there's a dip in both the radio, which is free-free continuum, and uh, in, the, in the dust. It's about, uh, uh, the diameter is about five parsecs. Uh, so a radius of about two and a half parsecs. 
Okay. Um, so about from about 1907, the sit 1977 situation is a nice paper by Weaver et al. that showed a, a, uh, a wind-dominated um, nebula. And so you have this central region that's basically everything is more or less evacuated because of the uh, uh, wind from the star. And then you have a, a large volume that's basically uh, sh uh, shock uh, uh, heated uh, nebula, nebula emission, uh, at least the low density is very hot. And by hot, I mean 10 to the 7th, or thereabouts, and a few times 10 to the 7th Kelvin. Uh, then you have a, a region just outside that, which is swept up uh, 10 to the 4K gas, typical nebular gas. Uh, and then uh, around this boundary here is a, a hydrogen ionization uh, front. And then the PDR region around that. Okay, that's kind of the, what one expected in 1977. So we're, we tried, uh, uh, John Everett and I tried to uh, uh, model this region using cloudy, Bob, uh, but a modification for a 3D by Morissette. Uh, and these are the input parameters we put into that. The only assum assum assumption in this is that the density had a power law with a, an exponent of about minus 2. Okay, so what we're interested in here are the dust properties in a wind-shocked environment. So we're going to look at grain temperatures, sputtering time scales, grain resonance times, average grain charge, and uh, dust cooling fraction. Uh, well, the results of this model, I'm just going to quickly give you the results. So that what we're plotting here is grain uh, size, radius, in microns, uh, versus distance from the center of the star. If you take any, let's say, any uh, grain size and just go across this thing, uh, the, what you see is that the dust is pretty cool. It's only you know, 70 to 80 degrees, even when you're uh, within a half parsec of the central star. And of course, you go to long, uh, larger grains, it's even cooler. So the point here is that, that uh, these low grain temperatures implies that you're not going to uh, destroy those grains by evaporative dissociations. It will not be important in, in these regions. Uh, Spectrum lifetimes. Uh, basically, uh, the, for the smallest grains, uh, in fact, they, they have uh, fairly short lifetimes, less than 10 to the 5 years. We think the age of this nebula is probably like 10 to the 6 years or so. And so we don't expect uh, these small grains to survive very long, uh, simply due to sputtering. Larger grains can have life, a large, longer lifetime. Sputtering will not destroy those on time scales. It's important. Uh, so what I'm plotting here is the dwell time in the H2 region. And so, for example, let's say you release a grain at a given distance from the center of the star uh, of, a given, of a given size. Uh, the colors here tell us basically how long it takes that grain to be swept out of the, out of the uh, nebula. And uh, it, basically, it doesn't matter where you release the, the grain inside this, in, inside this nebula. Uh, they're not going to stay there much longer than a few times 10 to 4 years. So basically, what this tells us is there, there shouldn't be any dust in this. Wow, I'm already, OK, I'm going to have to skip a bunch of stuff. Uh, there should be any dust inside these, these uh, regions is what it's telling us. Uh, let me also say a little bit about uh, graphite, uh, the grain uh, charge. The upper left-hand corner of this, all the grains in this region, where uh, this is uh, density, space density versus luminosity, uh, all the grains up here are very strongly negatively charged. Okay, and that's because basically <coughs> in these higher densities, uh, you get lots of collisions and you get you bumping electrons uh, 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 you're ca capturing a lot of electrons, that's uh, what's happening here. On this part, uh, basically uh, the grains are, are here uh, all positively, reasonably strongly positively charged. And this is the region that we're talking about here, uh, is fairly low densities, but uh, fairly high luminosities. And uh, so what happens here is that the uh, electron sees a ch highly positively charged grain, of course it comes, slaps right onto the grain. Uh, but it can't come off very easily. It's got to uh, uh, work against Coulomb forces. And so it's a, a highly effective coolant. And just point out that basically when you, uh, at temperatures a few times 10 to the 5, dust simply just takes, takes off. All the, all the heating, all the cooling is done by, 
by uh, the dust. So here's a kind of a, a spectral energy distribution of that nebula, and here's the stellar input here. But there's all this X-ray emission down here with bright lines. There's a big far infrared hump here. Uh, where's that emission coming from? Because the star is not putting it in there. Well, it turns out the star is. Okay, issues. So 24 micron uh, emission. I'll try to see if I can get my not get into this trouble again. 24 micron emission says dust actually does exist in this H2 region. Uh, even in the hot windshock regions, that's where that's where you get most of the emission. The 24 microns. The dust residence times are small relative to the age of the bubbles. So why in the heck are those grains there? And my conclusion is that you need a continuous source of grains somewhere. Uh, where did they come from? Well, maybe from embedded neutral condensation that's been overrun by the ionization front. Um, maybe they're entraining neutral condensation from the PDR region, the H2 regions. There's a lot of turbulent uh, motions here. Uh, or release of dust from the circumstellar disk around young lower mass stars that are associated with the formation of the of a massive, of this O5 star, for example, or some combination of all these. <laughs> but what this does do is it leads us to a very different uh, picture of, of these windblown bubbles, namely <laughs> that we need some uh, dense, neutral, uh, probably cooler condensations inside this, inside this uh, wind-shocked region. Now, I can tell you that I don't care what resolution you, you, you observe with, with VOBI, uh, you see uh, structures in the interstellar medium that is at least as small as your best resolution so far. And so we know that the interstellar medium is very clumpy. And uh, so whether this is, this is uh, uh, clumps that have been um, uh, overrun by the ionization front or what, uh, this is one possible picture. It seems like the only one that I, I know of that will actually work. And so we have a, a different picture then. We have the hot shocked gas here with neutral condensations in it, the wind evacuated region. And then you have a conduction front that uh, basically goes back to the roughly 10 to 4K gas with higher densities uh, surrounding that. And then the ionization front outside that and the PDR region around that. Um, just show you some uh, condensations and uh, 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 planetary nebulae. But uh, here's the Orion propylids. And these are, uh, for example, uh, disks probably around uh, stars near the trapezium that are uh, being slowly photo evaporated. There's another one. So it's not completely uh, ridiculous that uh, you might have these condensations. So summary on this uh, is that dust impacts on windblown bubbles is fairly important. Uh, the, the, the dust is uh, mostly po uh, posit strongly positively charged, and thus, therefore, dominates the cooling in these hot wind shocked gas. And the result of that is that the gas temperatures are lowered, much substantially lower than you, you uh, would expect, and the uh, internal energy in these nebulae are also lower because uh, the dust is radiating uh, the energy away uh, very, very effectively. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the uh, radii are smaller uh, for, a given, uh, for a given age and, and ambient density than expected in the absence of dust. Uh, and so the, if you want to estimate it, uh, ages, it's not simply related to the size of the ambient interstellar medium that's holding this stuff in. Uh, you, you do need to worry about what dust is doing there. Uh, ionization structure, one, these things don't look cooler than you would infer uh, from just looking at the, the uh, uh, for example, the various uh, uh, emission lines and so forth. That's because the, du the uh, dust is uh, uh, basically uh, radiating a lot of the energy away very fast. Basically, look at the distribution of pHs in the galaxy. And this is another picture taken just with the IRAC images. And you see that the whole galactic plane here is just full of this, all this red and yellow emission is due to pHs. And it's a diffuse emission right through the disk of galaxy. Uh, here's another picture of doing the same thing. And um, I'm sorry that these things, the images distorted here for reasons I don't fully understand.
understand. But anyway, uh, one thing we can do is take the, <coughs> uh, just basically take a slice through the, the disk of the galaxy in longitude and measure uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, emission in the various bands. And uh, this heavy line here is the observed observations. And the gray part is a model that uh, uh, we're using uh, uh, various, the, the various combinations of stars going from supergiant stars, AGB stars, giants, and so forth. And look at the contribution of each of those based on uh, a stellar, the stellar distributions of Wayne's Cove et al. and Cohen et al. 93, 94, 95. Uh, and we used the uh, uh, Dream and co-workers work from 2001 to 2007 on uh, the emissivities for uh, pHs um, and uh, the Costelli and Cruz uh, uh, atmosphere models uh, to, try to, to try to model this to get a handle on it. Now these bumps that you see here are real. Those are H2 regions as you scan through and you get a spike as you go through uh, an H2 region. This, this goes uh, from 65 degrees uh, to minus 65 degrees uh, and through the galactic uh, plane. So this is longitude. This is latitude here, plus or minus one degree. Uh, okay, and so you can see the contributions. And you see that this model, uh, that, by the way, this is a paper by Tom Lobital and the core black uh, uh, glimpse team. And I should mention the core glimpse team. Uh, this, none of this would have happened without Marilyn Mead, Brian Babler, uh, uh, Marilyn handles all, all of our pipeline uh, work. Brian does a quality assurance of our catalogs and so forth. And uh, then Barb Whitney, Bob Benjamin, uh, Tom Robiton, and myself as a core team. There have been other people involved, but they've come and go. But these are the uh, people that have, that have stuck with the project from the beginning. Uh, okay, so you see that we, we have a pretty good uh, distribution of uh, uh, model that fits the observations rather well. And um, now we'll extend it on to the 4 micron, 60 micron, and 100 micron. Not quite so good with the 60 micron. We're overestimating for uh, um, at least as far as the observations are concerned. Now that could be uh, possible issues with the observations as well. Uh, but you know, I, I think these are almost acceptable uh, fits. And so, what does this tell us? Well, we know that inside H2 regions, there are no PAHs that are destroyed by hard UV radiation. If I'm just, I'll finish up here in a second. So, uh, the uh, PAHs that are excited by soft ultraviolet radiation, the photons that can, that can pass through hydrogen ionization from it. And so this, distribution of pHs is telling us something about the uh, sources of excitation in their distribution. And uh, as I say, we know the stars that uh, roughly was producing that. Uh, but it also raises some other interesting uh, questions. And that is, pHs are big molecules that contain a lot of carbon, 50, 50, 50 carbon atoms or so. If you distri distribute that throughout the disk of the galaxy, uh, you're going to have a lot of carbon tied up in these PAHs. <coughs> um, and uh, uh, basically, in order to fit those, we had to increase by about 50% the uh, fraction of dust uh, that uh, Adrian and Lee uh, proposed for the PAHs. So we, we, had, we had to have more, uh, uh, a larger fraction of dust. So the 3.6 micron band is is dominated by giants, and a little bit of uh, main sequence stars, and uh, uh, quite a few PAHs. At 4.5, there's no P. Uh, anyway, giants basically dominate the leaves. But once you get to 5.8 and 8 microns, it's all PAHs. Uh, MIPS 24 has a substantial fraction of PAHs and very small grains. And the time you get out to 1600, it's mostly small, very small, and small grains. Um, so there's my summary on that section, and I will stop there for running out of time. The results that you showed on the prior spectrum.
suggests that there are these arms that were previously seen as discontinuous. Mm -hmm. discontinuous. I had the impression that the, the three kiloparsec arm, on the other hand, didn't really fit in that scheme. Is that, is that true? Or? Well, no, I think it does. Uh, you can see that there's a... Um, <laughs> the four kiloparsec arm seems to follow that feature there, and there's a feature that does the same thing over here. So I think it's, it's not a bad uh, correlation. Frank, I'm sorry. Ed, uh, in the uh, windswept uh, H2 region picture, uh, whatever those condensations are that provide Dust, they must also be providing gas. Yeah, they do. I'm, I'm sure they do. Have you tried to estimate what the dust to gas ratio is in, in those in, this, uh, what, what, in the in the whole region in the general region? Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. One thing I did do is I checked the uh, lifetime I and mean, how long these things should mm -hmm. should exist. If they're dense enough, uh, you know, they're kind of like rocks. They they'll be around for uh, ten to six or so years. But uh, but I haven't checked the uh, Try to estimate the return of gas. Uh, in the, uh, we did uh, try to estimate the amount of dust. It was a pretty small amount. I forgot what it was. Hi, it's uh, Levi Stork. Thanks. So, um, in, as I understand it, the 24 micron emission comes from a similar, has a similar distribution to the free free radio emission. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So. Um, could it not just be that that, that, that this is associated with the warm um, 10 to the 4K uh, moderate density gas in the H2 region has nothing to do with the uh, with the hot bubble from the wind? No, it can't. It can't be. I mean, uh, I I worried about that issue. Uh, one, they're, they they uh, although there's a reasonable uh, overlap in the, uh, uh, from the free free. If you try to model 24 micron and the, the shorter wavelength stuff, uh, you find that just you can't do it with, with um, okay. you know, the, the tracing just the. Just the um, um, well, no, I'm sorry. I, they, they do overlap, and uh, so they, you know, they probably do you know, uh, occupy the same volume. We did have trouble trying to model the uh, 7 and uh, 24 micron emission. Now, that's another story that I'm going to here. Yes, here. Um, the Galactic Plane Survey made by the Bernie Satellite has revealed the existence of some kind of uh, future structures perpendicular to the Galactic Plane. And uh, there are hints of this structure also in the data from WMAP. I wonder whether in the infrared you can see something like this. Well, we only sampled one degree of the plane. So we're, we're talking about a little thin strip, two degrees wide. Uh, and so we don't we don't know what's going on above, above our... So we can't really say much about those. We know that some of those do, however, are anchored down in the disk where there's a really massive star formation. 